get started. We are here for the October 29th, um, 2020 Finance Committee. I think it's Finance Committee meeting number three with the two remaining um, Finance Committee members and trustees Shaw and Lish. Um, agenda for this evening is to discuss fiscal incentive policy, COVID assistance grants and the effective, effectiveness thereof. Um, discussion of uh, and an out discussion on fiscal impacts between residential and commercial development. Reserve policies. Uh, general discussion on key performance indicators. And are there any other items anyone would like to chat about this evening on the agenda? If not, we'll go ahead and jump into the fiscal incentive uh, policy attached for uh, including the meeting materials was essentially our was our existing policy, a little bit of background information on that created in 2008. Um, this was one of the kind of first items of the manager at the time, you know, essentially he wanted to get a document out there that identified that Superior did in fact have fiscal incentives. We were willing to work with uh, with businesses to, to get them in here. It was not predicated on uh, any, any pending or potential business um, to come on in. Um, so we've had this on the books for 12 years. You know, I'm not sure technically I have ever got a call and someone asked, you know, I want to see your fiscal incentive policy and, um, you know, let's go ahead and, and talk, talk incentives. But I think it was just a, uh, you know, just a, a document to start, start conversations and let folks know we're, we're open for business. So Paul, just a question. I mean, as far as I, I know, this is the first time I ever found this or saw it. I, uh, I could never find this on our town website what i mean huh. and, and maybe it w i didn't know where to look um, and i'll have to check neil i i know it was on there before it, okay it, uh, it could have gotten lost so i i think that's a good good reminder to refresh all this information on there well and, and the reason i ask is i know adam's working on a draft of you know kind of the web page and and sort of you know doing business in superior because this in my head should be front and center um you know, like, hey, if, you, if this is interesting to you, this is what we have as table stakes. Right. And my thought is, you know, it should be on that economic development page and obviously it is, it is not there. So um, yeah, that would be helpful, wouldn't it? And then just, um, Paul, can you give us some background? I mean, I looked at these and these numbers are really, really big. You know, ten million dollar investment in a town that has a forty million dollar operating budget. Um, you know, the number of employees. We don't have any businesses with fifty employees. <clears throat> that you know, I mean, because Boulder County average wage is like what sixty five thousand a year. So I think most people wouldn't be adding that many jobs. So it was a was a thought here in twenty in two thousand eight. Obviously, it's it's a time machine. You know, landing a big box retailer kind of thing was that sort of what this was envisioned as. You know, per, and that's maybe the third bullet um, where we were talking about a minimum of a quarter million in new net sales tax revenues. I think it was going big in all of those categories. A new retailer, you know, a just someone investing in some some property or a facility here in town, or adding new new uh, staff. Um, and I think it was just establishing a, a higher threshold. I, I specifically, Neil, can't remember why those thresholds were set. You know, a lot of, and this is some of the information that Neil provided, a lot of the incentives, at least around here, you know, will get down to, you know, relatively innocuous new businesses with a handful of folks with, you know, just some minor, um, you know, personal property and real property, property investment. And, you know, I can't remember discussing that necessarily. Well, and, and I, I don't, I'm not surprised. I mean, 2008, the, the world market for retail is very different. I, I mean, yep. I think we all thought Costco's of the world were where we're headed. And in 2008, that made sense. And I think obviously 12 years on, it's changed. Big box is struggling. So it's just, I wanted to just get a little bit of insight. And I think if you think about the marketplace and what it looks like now, 
this policy makes a lot of sense with what we had envisioned for the marketplace because right? this predated STC as well. So um, I think that's good context with you know, what the town looked like back then. And, and to a lesser degree, what the market looked like. So, yeah. and, and I would add that, uh, you know, the, the strategy that we've employed to date in trying to attract commercial users to um, that, you know, our, our Amazon proof has been really to focus in on um, <clears throat> experiential retailers and uh, experiences that can be offered to the community that would be, you know, destination. Obviously with COVID that's been impacted substantially, but when you look at these level of investment requirements and the average wages, that would, um, that would eliminate a lot of these groups. So uh, another way to think about it, Adam, is in the context of everyone you've talked to, would anyone qualify for these thresholds? The only one that would potentially qualify for these would be if the criteria, you know, if it was, if you didn't have to meet all of the criteria, if you didn't have to meet the job creation, the investment and the tax generation. Yeah. I mean, a hotel would be a minimum of $10 million in, in taxable private sector investment. They wouldn't meet the job creation criteria um, and half a million, a quarter million in, in net revenues to the town. So they would meet two out of the three. Um, but I, you know, and I, I, a hotel is different, obviously, because we'd go through this process of evaluating it and, and negotiating with them, um, as we have done in the past. But I do think that the smaller users and, and those that we are, we know we're going to be competing with other communities, uh, along the 36 corridor, uh, for them to have a policy that would, that would not in, incorporate, uh, a smaller destination type use. Uh, I think puts us at a disadvantage. So, you know, I, I, it, it's hard to have a prescription uh, or some prescribed criteria for incentives because you may have businesses that are, that provide other types of benefit to the community um, and may not be a substantial economic development impact, but may be quality of life, may be providing amenities to the community, things that people want to see and want to have. Um, that could be um, explored on a case-by-case -case basis. If that so makes sense. has this document at, at all uh, influenced your discussions at all with, with potential uh, targets? No, it has not. Okay. I mean, we've pursued, we've pursued groups independent of this policy. And, um, you know, a lot of the groups that we've been um, recruiting and, you know, pre-COVID and, and even during COVID, I mean, they're, <clears throat> they would be groups where if they were asking for incentives, you know, it, it would be on a case by case basis, I think. And if it were not in accordance with this policy, I, I, I think that that would be, you know, just a, a town board decision, but the, it, it hasn't influenced who we've been reaching out to. Um, it, it hasn't, um, deterred us from reaching out to groups that wouldn't qualify for this. Um, and I, I think just administratively, it, it may be easier to do, um, to do incentives for smaller, for smaller businesses on a case by case basis, based on what they are providing to the community and if it aligns with the community's desires and wants and needs. So Adam, um, I think I have a slightly different view. One is, you know, table stakes, like if you're looking to relocate your business from, I don't know, say Texas, you're going to go and look at the Louisville website, the Lafayette website, Broomfield website, and see what incentives are out there. And you're going to kind of start augering in on the ones that are attractive. So in my head, you kind of want to have comparable or comp competitive incentives available for anybody. But then, you know, when they give us a call, and that's a problem, we, we don't have anybody calling us. When they give us a call, we at least you know, point out that we are flexible because right now you're doing a tremendous amount of work of reaching out to, to talk to people. But we don't have a lot of people coming in out of the ether to talk to us that I'm aware of. Well, I think there's a couple of issues. There are a couple of reasons why, why that's occurring. And I can, I can go and talk to those in detail, but I, you know, I think to, to my point about a case by case basis, I, I think what would be helpful would be to say these are the areas in which incentives can be offered or 
abatements or things like that, and maybe not being specific with percentages and what amounts they might be because it would vary business by business and what thresholds they would need to meet in order to qualify for those types of incentives. But, you know, I look at Lafayette and the way that they approach it is they make known that they're flexible and, and the areas of, um, you know, potential incentives. And then it, they, they work on uh, an incentive arrangement on a case by case basis. And, and I, I like that approach um, because it, it provides, I think the town with some great flexibility and it also indicates to the business community that this is a business friendly community and that they want to see new jobs and new investment without um, a, a great de degree of specificity. In my experience, economic development prospects and businesses that are looking, first they'll look at, uh, well, it depends on the business, but if we're talking office users, if we're talking industrial users, first and foremost is workforce. That's their number one concern. Second are gonna be land use economics. Um, you know, is, is the project supported based on the cost of land and the cost of buildings? Is there an existing facility already in place? And I, I would say third, maybe even fourth on the list would be incentives. And if they're making a determination as far as what community they're gonna be, look, they're gonna be looking into, um, if, if we meet the criteria, the, the, the most important criteria in terms of workforce and in, in terms of land use economics, existing facilities, um, then they would enter into a discussion about incentives. So in, in my experience, if they are looking at available space or available land, they're gonna be reaching out first to find out what's available in the community and, and inquire about the workforce, obviously, and, and then have a discussion on incentives after those three major key points uh, have been met. With Superior, okay. definitely go ahead. Workforce well, and, and, is strong. We meet that in states. What, what we have a struggle with is the availability of space for users. Um, and you, you pointed out a business that had located in the Louisville. Uh, and, and that's kind of a different product type that I, I, we don't have. It would be great if we had it in Superior, but, but we don't have that. No, but I use that, Adam, I use that as an example, right? If I'm looking to locate a five person business, a 15 person business, I don't call the town. I call the real estate agent for office space. And he says, hey, we got, you know, 4,000 square feet at Superior Point. And that's the sum and total of what typically happens for very, very small businesses. But if there's also an incentive, if this town said, hey, if you're going to locate a 15 person company here, we're going to give you some we're going to give you an incentive. Like we don't offer that right now. And the broker who's selling that, that space, it could be anybody. Like how do we link into that office space releasing so that we're on the radar of the business that's in Lions and they want to grow out a little bit more because they've outgrown their space, right? That's the piece that I, I want. I mean, because, and, and we've talked about this ad nauseum, right? There's, there's the empty retail stuff at, at Marketplace. That's one type of product that is a very different type of incentive, but that's linking into bricks more and telling them, hey, we can have an incentive if you can bring a business in here. And they, they would know to reach out to us. I don't know about somebody who's subleasing or rather releasing an office space area um, that they would know to call us. And my thought was if we had it on the website, like, hey, here's a phone number, call it. And I don't, we don't have that. And it's more than just you know getting our name out, and it's more than you you being on the phone answering every single one of these calls, because I don't think there's a lot of value add. But it's more of hey, if it's if it's X, Y, or Z, and, and the reason I, I sent the link out to Nebraska, Nebraska is a is a different state. They don't do one off negotiations. Everything is statutory, so they have six tiers, and if you hit the tier, you automatically get the incentive once you applied for it. Um, and that's where I'm kind of hoping we can think about going because it at least makes it clean that, hey, if you do this, this is automatic. You don't have to wait for the town to approve it and so on and so forth. But we are also willing to negotiate above and beyond these. But you know, if you meet the basic criteria, you get it. So I guess, <clears throat> so just to make sure Neil, I'm hearing you right. Adam talked about uh, how Lafayette does it right now that it's just kind of, it's out there. These are the areas we can help you with, but it's case by case <clears throat> you prefer. Because right now I'm having a, a 
bring it back to what the policy currently looks like. It's, it's clearly a bit outdated, doesn't necessarily fit the market we're looking for. I think we need to make some adjustments to the policy. The real question is, do we keep it open the way Lafayette does and just put out there to the world, these are the things we'll consider, uh, but not put, not put uh, parameters around them? Or do we actually have tiers that you come in, you come to Superior and you get A, B, C, and D, depending on, on what you bring? My feeling is the latter, right? Because, and, and there's a lot of reasons for it. One is, you know, Bro Broomfield has a huge and extensive track history of executing on the incentives that people want. If you're a small business and you're trying to decide, do I want Broomfield who, I've got a good sure shot of getting what they're telling me. Or do I want Superior who has never given an incentive to anybody other than downtown Superior, where am I gonna go? As opposed to us saying, hey, you know, if you're gonna invest $2 million, you automatically get this incentive. If you want more than that, come talk to us. Or we are willing to talk also in addition to whatever it is that we lay out as table stakes. Because we're, we're playing catch up here, guys. That's my point. And if you're playing catch up, we have got to exceed what's out there already on a, on a sort of established basis. And, and that's where my head was at too. I want to make sure, hey, <clears throat> obviously our, our direct competition is our neighbors. Um, so what I think our benchmark is to identify exactly what our neighbors offer and then either match or beat it. Um, Lafayette sounds like that's a bit difficult because it's a case by case, but yeah, if, if we've got solid broom, uh, uh, benchmarks of Broomfield, and I apologize, Neil, I didn't have a chance to read all of the emails that came through today. So I might've missed, it, this might've been included in what you said, but yeah. No, if, it wasn't. I, I don't, I, and I'll be honest, I haven't done a lot of research into what our neighbors are offering, you know, as list price. Yeah, and I think this is what, you know, it's, it's like negotiating a car, right? There's a starting price. They put it on their website. We don't have it on our website other than this $10 million investment. And honestly, if I'm thinking about a, a $1 million business and I see that the only incentive that's documented requires a $10 million investment, I just, I, I honestly turn and look at Broomfield because, you know, I mean, I can, I can look at my window. I can see in a Broomfield. So for most businesses, that's, you know, the, the location, as we saw with the hotel, they're agnostic to whether it's you know 8027 or, or something else. They're just going to, what can I get sold through my investment committee internally quicker and easier? And if I say, well, you know, I need to go talk to Superior, then they got to go and run it through council, and then they got to decide versus, you know, hey, Broomfield, here's what they're going to give me at the start. It makes that part of the discussion very quick. And we can say, hey, this is what you're going to get, and we can probably talk about more depending on what it is that you're bringing into the community that we can benefit from. And Adam, and, and, and this isn't to take away from all the work you've already done. It's more of like, how do we get the word out that we are open for business and that we are willing and, and able to talk and not only willing to talk, but here's what we've already done. So you don't even have to talk to us, you just get this. Yeah, we've done some research on Lafayette, on uh, Broomfield and Louisville, and um, we had sent that over to Matt, but I don't know if it got forwarded along to the two of you. So I'll, I'll make sure that we send that out. We will look through their budgets uh, and their websites uh, and compile that information together. So I'll, I'll make sure that gets over to you. I apologize that it, it didn't before this meeting. Um, well, and, I, and I think it's just a good baseline for where we want to go. I think, uh, I mean, so Paul, I, I, you tell me if Neil's reading and my reading and is just off base that, that we're looking, that we need to essentially revamp what that policy is. I mean, I, I see that there's value in a policy, but I don't think that, that what's reflected in that policy now is necessarily what we want to put out to the world. Is, is that a fair, fair statement on your side as well? Yes, I mean, based on based on those limits, absolutely. That's that's not the world we're living in right now. Okay, so I, so a, I think there's kind of general consensus that we need to uh, update the policy. B, I, I think there's general consensus that uh, we we benchmark to our neighbors and either meet or exceed those. Um, and and I think after that, then it just it comes to uh, bringing it back to the full board and, and getting it approved and implemented. Um, I suppose, uh, Adam, Paul, Jeff, is there anything from, from Niels and I's perspective that you guys need in helping to, to craft 
that policy further or do you have what you would need to update and craft that policy? Um, well, following your lead then, Ken, yes, we do have the um, incentive of information of the neighbors, which uh, Adam will get out to you too, that we can kind of use as a minimum threshold. Um, I, I, I guess I'm struggling, struggling is too tr strong of a word, but you know, generally are, are, are we open for business like Bloomfield? You know, and I'll use the example and it's a little bit dated, but you know, Bloomfield gave gives and, and gave them in the past an incentive for, you know, a meat shop that hired three, three people. And I can't imagine it was anywhere near the, you know, average wage numbers. Are, are we happy with, with any job, you know, any clarification with that? You know, Adam, what, I guess, what are your thoughts as it relates to, do we, do we interject if we're looking at jobs, do we interject, you know, minimum wage thresholds as, as some minimum criteria? Um, I, I think what we can do is we can look at um, maybe a, a small business approach, uh, you know, and, and really look at what type of business it is. You know, I, I know that in the past we've, uh, in, in talking with stakeholders, they, you know, they really wanted to see, um, you know, food and beverage operators in the community. So maybe we tailor something that might be more specific to, to food and beverage, um, you know, and, and we can do that, whether it's through um, a level of specificity in terms of the types of business, you know, because they're having a, a wage requirement for them probably doesn't make sense. But, um, you know, for other types of businesses for office use, uh, I think that that would be, um, a good threshold to have in terms of wages, um, you know, because I, I, it, it does depend on the type of use that the built that the business has, uh, and to align the incentives appropriately around that. Um, you know, we certainly don't want to incentivize office users who are coming in and opening up a call center, right? Um, because that's not a good use of any of the office space. I don't feel like in Superior. Um, you know, but if they were coming in and, and opening up um, a tech company or something at, at above average wages, above average wages for the county, then that would be something that you'd want to incentivize, um, incentivize heavily. So I, I almost think, uh, guys, we, we look at maybe the type of business it is. And then within that, you know, particularly on the office side, we, we could probably look at doing tiers. Uh, for how much the investment is, what, what the jobs are, um, and so on and so forth. And, and maybe we look at these other uses uh, in, in terms of um, what would be appropriate uh, performance-wise to, um, to measure their, um, their, their participation, their contribution to the community. Does that make sense? Yeah. It does. And actually, this is a really good uh, line of questions, Paul and, and Adam, because, you know, if you think about just on the retail side, you know, an incentive that brings in a person, you know, a five person service company does almost nothing for the town in terms of revenue. Um, but a five percent person cheese shop, it's a very different dynamic. And that's a piece that we got to try to figure out and balance out. Um, you know, because I think what we're starting to see happen in uh, the Safeway Shopping Center and the Superior Marketplaces, as we are losing some of the restaurants, we're starting to see more service-oriented businesses, which just don't have the same tax impact. And, and, and I, we to be careful. <laughs> yeah, and I, <clears throat> Paul, to your, to your earlier question of, uh, are, are we open to a uh, business like Greenfield is giving incentive to a meat shop or something like that? In my mind, I, th I think we start more more open and generous than than not. And my my off the cuff answer is yes. I that is something we would do. And we we have so many storefront vacancies. If we can help drive a uh, a any type of small businesses, I mean, I, I look at like Brain Balance or something, uh, for example, in the marketplace. I mean, I I don't know what they're their tax revenue generation for the town is, but I imagine it's not terrifically high. But, but they're coming in, they're adding value to the community. They're they're filling a, a vacant area, and and the more we drive down that vacancy, the better it is uh, for for the area as a whole. So I, 
obviously if it, we're not going to give a gigantic incentive to to a, a meat shop or something that comes in but if it's something that will push them over the hump i think it's worth considering and i again it comes down to i don't know how we tier that appropriately but that's something i'm willing to consider yeah i agree with ken i mean i think the way we've been doing it hasn't worked so let's just tell everybody we're wide open for business and you know worry more about oversaturation later and how do we measure success <laughs> if we have filled all the vacancies in those two shopping centers? Is that, is that success? No, I mean, that's a good point, Paul. I mean, the, the ultimate question is right now, those empty spaces pay us literally zero. You know, we don't have, we don't have any incremental tax revenue coming from any of them. We, we have the property tax that we're going to get from you know, the space and that might materially change with you know, greater occupancy, but probably not. Um, the main thing is in my head, and I think this is question number um, three on the agenda, you know, in, in terms of the physical impacts of commercial versus residential, you know, if your baseline is residential, every incremental dollar above that is a net benefit to the community. You know, if all we're getting from residential is the startup tap fees and the ongoing property tax, that's your baseline. But then if we are able to, you know, for sake of argument, fill in a retail space that's going to generate, you know, that incremental dollar. To me, that's a win. Could it have been an incremental two or three dollars? Possibly. But once you've netted out the incentives, we as a town are better off if we're filling up these spaces. And in theory, you should start to find the businesses that work well here, that survive well and thrive, will be the ones that benefit the community. And, and my thought is that they there's going to be met, there's going to be several ways we can measure success obviously eliminating vacancies that's that's success to a point i think bringing in a diversity of storefronts uh to, to offer more services to the community there's success in that uh bringing more diversity in tax revenue there's success there um, i think where we just want to be uh we don't want to get uh head over heels in offering incentives that are out of uh out of alignment with the net return, I think. So obviously if we were to give an incentive to us, we'll keep using the meat shop example. I, I wouldn't want to give any type of incentive that is more than the town is going to recoup in projected tax revenue over like a, a one or two year, whatever the appropriate time frame is basis. So it's, we, we can net it out and, and call a break even maybe two years or three years down the road, whatever we, we come to as appropriate or what our, our neighbors are using as a baseline. But I think that's I, as long as as long as we can do that and, and net out on a uh, reasonable time frame, I I think it's still a value add. And I think that's most of these are structured. And Adam, I didn't look into the detail, but you know, most of them that I've seen around here, there's there they are performance based. Um, and and you look at, um, you know, they have to generate a new X dollar that, that they're getting back. It's either a one-time dollar perhaps with uh, the building use tax or the, or the ongoing, ongoing revenues. So it is performance-based based on new revenues over you know a period of time and a, and a dollar threshold. Am I looking at that wrong, Adam? No, that's right. Yeah, they are post-performance for the most part. And um, you know there are some rebates that are provided uh, you know, with building permit fees and, and those types of things that wouldn't necessar necessarily be post-performance, but, um, you know, because those are provided uh, when they when they submit those. But I think um, looking at the type of business that it is, what, you know, if it's, if it's um, uh, got a, a high, uh, high risk threshold, you know, maybe those are the types of businesses that you want to pull back a little bit in terms of providing incentives because it's not sure if they're going to make it or not um, as compared to maybe a, a business that's that's been a successful going concern for many years and is looking to expand and grow. So I think there are some factors to take into consideration in addition to you know, what what type of investment or jobs they're going to be making. We want to know, is this business a dog? You know, are they just going to come in, set up shop, fail in a year or two, uh, and we we may have provided an incentive to them, or or do they have staying power? Mm -hmm. I think that needs to be taken into consideration as well. 
And I think that performance piece is important. I mean, it, it, we want we wanted to come here, but these certainly aren't grants. They there's a a tit for tat, I would say. Which I agree with entirely. I think that the issue is ultimately, let, you know, when we get to something like a restaurant, which I don't think anybody would argue is not high risk, and you don't typically see incentives, you know, for restaurants. However, given our dearth of restaurants, you know, Louisville has seventy. I think we have ten. Um, I'd like us to find a way to get creative around restaurants, not and, and have it be a performance-based incentive, you know, so that if at the end of the year they survive rebate on the building taxes or, or whatever. I mean, you guys know that all the 19 different taxes that are out there and what, you know, makes us competitive. Um, but for a high risk business, um, I do want to think, because I, to me, a restaurant actually adds more value to the community than some of the service businesses that you might go to once a year. I try not to see my doctor any more than once a year, but I try to go to restaurants, you know, once or twice a week. Um, and I think as a community, we survive, we do better if we have more restaurants and then the office space will, will help them as well. But given the threshold, and let's ignore COVID for right now, uh, you know, given the threshold risk for restaurants, given where we are and the amount of open space we have around us, it's expensive to try to put a restaurant here. So how do we think about trying to bring more? Not to answer now, but as you think about some of those high risk businesses, how do we help de-risk them to want to try our community? So Adam, I've got a number of notes. I mean, I, I think maybe the next step is maybe staff and Adam starting to, you know, take a stab at modification of the policy to, you know, reflect the current current world environments. Is that is that what I heard? That works great for me. Adam, do you have any additional information that would be kind of helpful for us? Um, the, or clarification or guidance that we need from Neil and Ken um, in, in looking at getting a new draft policy together. Uh, no, just to clarify uh, the way that we're gonna approach this is, is we'll look at the type of business that it is, the type of uh, um, kind of building use, you know, uh, restaurant, office, retail. And then within those, we'll look at um, some tier structures um, and uh, look at our neighbors as a benchmark and, and develop some parameters uh, within those categories and tiers. Yeah, that would be, that'd be the holy grail. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. And then um, we'll, we'll certainly take a look at that and uh, come up with some, some metrics and how we measure success. And, um, you know, I want to say it is Louisville that, uh, that keeps track of, um, how much sales tax is generated per dollar of, of, of incentive. Um, and they also track the occupancy as well for those businesses that, um, that have been incentivized. So we can also develop uh, a performance matrix as well. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, okay. and, I, and I think this is obviously kind of phase one, we get the, we, we update the policy, we get the policy finalized and approved uh, and in place. And then I think step two, uh, and Adam, it sounds like based off the, the last uh, report that you provided, it sounds like we're already starting to, to look at a mock-up of our uh, website a little bit more and see what else we can put out there to, to let our website do, do the legwork for us. Uh, that way, if anybody from say Texas does is looking around that they've got all of this at their fingertips and know exactly what to expect uh, without even having to pick up the phone and eventually we want them to pick up the phone but we don't want them to gloss over us just because they couldn't find what, we were, what they were looking for yeah that's correct ken we did a mock-up um uh for uh, bringing the website up to date and being able to have more transparency um with the incentives and uh to to neil's point it, it will be front and center on that new website Great. That we put together. So, um, you know, Matt has that and, and I think it's just a matter of getting it over to the um, website manager to update it. Okay. Um, and not something that I think we need to uh, solve or figure out or probably even discuss, but just a, a seed to plant um, 
and, and I don't know where this goes or, or what the appropriate way to go about it is, but I, I've heard from several residents that there, there would be a desire to somehow uh, track our home-based businesses here in Superior that also provide their goods or service to superior residents. So we've got the brick and mortar covered. We know where they are. We, we, we help drive business to them. We have them listed on our website, but we're not able, we're not currently doing that for home-based businesses um, that also provide goods and or services to, to residents. So just, just something to, to, to percolate on and think if there's any good way to, to see if we can capture that and, and continue to drive it that way. I know we're, we don't, we get much more limited tax revenue uh, from there. So it's, it's less, but if we can continue to drive dollars into superior, uh, that, that brings spending to superior. And I think it's, it's a little thing that I think we could help out with. So yeah, we've done for future discussion. Uh, yeah, we've done that in the past. And I think the approach that we took was we looked at, um, businesses that had registered with the city, uh, with the town, uh, mm -hmm. where they're registered place of businesses and, and, but again, that doesn't let us know if they're providing services to superior residents. It's just no, we just know that they've got an LLC filed and they're right. in business in another home. But then the other thing that we've paired that with in the past is to do like a web crawl search um, where we just search through uh, you know, Google search terms and try and identify businesses within certain categories that may be providing services and that have a register. I mean, really what it was for was to audit businesses, whether they were getting licensed or not, but I think you could do it to, uh, to, to answer that question. Yeah, no, I like that. Okay. I, if it's, if it's not going to end up being worth it, or, or if we're going to, this will become too difficult or complicated, uh, then we don't need to go forward. But yeah, that sounds like that's at least a good starting point and can give us an idea of what's out there and what we can do with it. Okay. And we, as um, I think everybody on this call knows we are hiring a new economic development manager, which hopefully will be on board, you know, in early part of 2021. But I think obviously that individual um, should should have obviously some experience with this and, you know, may provide some some insights. So I, I guess long story short, I'm saying, you know, I'm, I'm to manage expectations. I'm, I'm not sure it makes sense. What you tell me it doesn't make sense to get a draft here, you know, January 1st, or do we want to, you know, start to, you know, let the new individual work on this as well? I, I'm not in a rush to get this done. I, I, yeah. I can wait. That's fine. You know, and I think this is, I mean, the policy we have is 12 years old. You know, there's no need to make it, you know, a new one effective January 1. It's not going to change anything. Um, but I do want us to consider this, you know, really important so that when the new person does come on it, it can go fast because at some point you know covid will be behind us and we're going to have some businesses that want to start moving in um and i want to be ready for it yeah sorry i thought we were talking about the the home-based business thing uh that that i i'm in no hurry on but yeah i the the sooner we can pull get get our policy pulled together the better and if we want to wait until we can have input from that new individual then yeah that's fine but uh, I would say getting that turned around fairly quickly once they're hired and they can get yeah. there would be important. Well, that, that helps. Thanks. Um, any additional comments on this item? I, I, I do. I, I have a couple of thoughts that um, on the development side of things that I wanted to run by um, Ken and Neil, and that is when, you know, I, looking at trying to attract in end users for new development projects. Um, you know, certainly the, um, the Resolute site comes to mind, but there may be other properties as well uh, within the community, you know, maybe even in, in downtown Superior. But there's not, there's not a clear path for um, creating a significant incentive for that the, the town may, may really want and have um, because you know we're, we're otherwise limited with uh, tax increment um, and those types of things you know because of the county and the school district and, and the participation there and, and just the political the political climate so one of the things that we've explored just in conversation um, and I don't think it's gone any further than just um, 
just conversing with uh, Clint and Matt was, um, and, and putting this on the table as an option um, for the town to purchase land and discount it in some way to an end user or doing a ground lease to an end user. Um, something along those lines would be, I think, a significant incentive. And again, I think to your point, Ken, you'd be looking at recouping that investment back over time um, through their, their, the taxes that they'd be paying. Um, and it would also have, uh, you know, some form of collateral as well. So you, you'd have an asset, um, you know, it, it wouldn't just be cash to a business. It, it would have uh, some level of collateral. So I mentioned that just because I know as you're, as, um, as we've looked and talked to prospects that, um, you know, land, land is expensive in the area. Uh, it's it's a, a factor in the overall cost of uh, a new development project, and uh, it, it could be a powerful a powerful tool if the if the town was open to using it. Not to say that that would be something we put on the website uh, and offer to purchase land and discount it, but you know for certain for certain end users that the town would want to see um, to to maybe throw that out as an option. But I wanted to get your thoughts on it. I'll go first. I, I, it, it can be, you know, one more thing in our arsenal of, of tools. Um, I'm not a huge fan of it just because the town already owns a fair amount of land in town. And um, I know it helps to de-risk, you know, potential market entrant, but I would actually like them to try to find us as a part of a consortium that could help it work. You know, if they're looking, you know, bringing a business in, then maybe we can be part of the landowners, not the sole and only landowner. Only because right now um, we own a lot of land. Yeah, my, I mean, obviously just trying to think through the, the logistics of something like that. I don't think we would pay cash for, for the land. So Paul, we'd have to issue some debt to, to purchase it. So whatever the, whenever this were to occur, I think, interest rates would play a, a piece in it and what what is our uh, our payments out the door and and then what's uh, what can we reasonably expect to recoup and and making sure we have a strong understanding of that risk profile from our side I mean obviously there's a lot more risk uh, that we're taking on if we do something like that um, I mean we can always use use that land for something else if it doesn't work out um, but yeah, I mean, we, we we already have the town fifteen that that we own, and not not saying we need to do anything with it right now, but but we're not doing anything with it. Um, and the ridge, <laughs> ridge two. Yep. Which we'll grow into, but yeah. Um, I don't know, Paul. Do you have any any knee jerk reactions on that? You know, I'll just go from my experience. I worked in uh, Thornton prior to coming to Superior. Uh, we acquired you know, a fair amount of land. Um, and over that dozen years, you know, we, we essentially then, you know, we're the landowner and we're trying to facilitate development there and you know, nothing happened for a dozen years. So there's a risk, there's a sunk cost. Yes, it's an asset. Um, different situation in Loveland, you know, the old HP facility in, in Loveland that's kind of changed hands, but the city of Loveland bought that and, um, you know, they had, they have had, you know, I think eight or 10 years of difficulty trying to redevelop that property that just came in the news this last week or so, where a local developer has bought that. But there's, if we're getting into that particular realm, it, it is higher risk, you know, there's some cash, uh, cash involved here. And, uh, you know, I, I would caution, you know, from my conservative nature that the, the, the payback may be years in coming, perhaps not. Yeah. So what I was suggesting would be if, if we had an end user in hand and they just can't make the economics work with the land cost and the vertical construction, it, it okay. wouldn't going out and buying the land speculatively and then turning around on the market and selling it at a discount. It would it would be in in terms of like a development agreement 
to try and make the economics on a on a an end user deal work. Sure. That's an um, in, in blood, blood pressure a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, and I said earlier, I want everything on the table, right? I I, I want us to to truly think of Superior being wide open for business, and we will consider any and all. And if you know us stepping in to help purchase the land makes the economics work and we can make the economics work on our side and we can de-risk it to where, you know, if we do this and they fail in a year, you know, how does it work? Um, if we can go through all that and it still works, I'm all for it. Yeah. And I think the other piece of that is it, it, that's the type of offer that I don't think is open to just anybody. Um, I think it's going to be a, the, the right type of business that the, will generate a, a higher portion of tax revenue for us or that that brings something special uh that that will draw more people in um to to the community so i i would say it's on the table but with a lot of caveats <laughs> if that's a really high table yeah it would it'd be a really high bar they'd have to meet in order to build for that for sure yeah but I mean, I think hopefully you're hearing from us. We're we're open to almost any discussion. We just want to start having more discussions. Yeah, and and I think there was when we had a conversation about a hotel uh, a year, year and a half ago. Okay, maybe it was two years ago. I don't know. Time time's lost most of its meaning. <laughs> um, I I would have. I would have spoke differently during that meeting than I would today. I, I, I am having been in this seat for a little bit more, a little bit more now and, and having a better sense of things. I, I would have pushed harder for us to move, move on that. So I, I don't think there was greater, or I don't think there was a, obviously a, a temperature from the board to move forward that night, but today those are the types of things I'm willing to, to, to hear and, and consider and help push other board members to consider as well. Well, I think I can say you probably made the right decision knowing where we are right now with COVID. Yeah, I, I mean, in hindsight, it was great, but <laughs> in hindsight, it was the right decision to make. Yeah. But for wasn't made for necessarily the right reasons at that point. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Adam, did you have something else you wanted to bring up? No, I think that's I think that's it. You know, I just wanted to throw another tool out there on the table to to plant a seed and 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 make that uh, make that known so no and i think you know obviously you've seen what we're working on with 1500 colton and i kind of view it the same way right where we stepped in to buy the land we're redeveloping it and if we can find the right partner to run it great um i can't i can see something like that happening at some of the other parcels it just it's it's a function of economics and town needs Okay, are we ready to move on to COVID business assistance grants and evaluation of effectiveness, effectiveness thereof? And Adam, I, I really have no input on this, so I'm just gonna kind of let you help with the help with this item here. Well, yeah, I, I, it's been a lifeline for sure for every single business that's qualified for this and that's put in and has received uh, grant funding. It's um, it, it's done some. Uh, it's made a tremendous impact in the business community. Everyone that we've spoken to has just expressed their profound gratitude to the town uh, for providing this level of support, um, given the the headwinds that they that everyone's facing, uh, and. You know, hopefully there's maybe more assistance that's going to be provided in the future. Who knows with what's happening with, uh, you know, the, the second round of, of CARES Act funding. But it, it has been extremely valuable and useful for businesses to meet their current liabilities, um, to help them while they're restructuring things, um, retrenching their business, uh, and allow them to continue as going concerns. So I, I think... We'll get, uh, you know, as we emerge from COVID-19, I think we'll get a better sense for just how impactful those have been, what businesses have been able to be saved um, and, and which ones uh, are going to be able to accelerate out of recovery faster, um, you know, because they've been able to utilize those resources. Um, 
and, you know, unfortunately in that first round of grant funding, I know that there have been some businesses that have, um, have, have not been successful, have not been able to make it. Um, but I do know that those that are continuing to, to operate, they've, they've been profoundly grateful for the contributions that the town has made and, and the grants that have been made. With that being said, um, I, I think having flexibility with those grants has been, has been very, very helpful um, to, to have them pay for things that they may not otherwise cover through uh, other sources. And, uh, and, and that's been really helpful. So I know that there are, there are continuing needs. Uh, it, it's primarily around trying to just get people into the businesses um, and, and increasing the, the, the customers that are coming through the door. Um, there are, uh, there, there's a huge need on that. And um, I think businesses are, are really, you know, trying to figure things out still uh, of how they're gonna uh, be able to uh, increase their revenue uh, during this time, but the, the grants have been um, very, very helpful. Have you, uh, do you have any updates or uh, insight into how many businesses, if any, have utilized the, the C source uh, matching uh, advertising program that, that we put out there? Yeah, there's been um, five that we've spoken to and that have expressed interest in that program. Uh, I think there's three that have pulled the trigger and moving forward with it into that um, had expressed interest, but we haven't been able to close the loop on them with them. Um, and there are, there are, there were, well, there's at least one business that uh, requested that um, instead of utilizing C source, if they could just use Facebook, um, they've had, and, and that's been their marketing channel and they've had success with that, uh, to, to utilize Facebook and, and have the town match that. And I talked with Matt and he said that that would be fine. Um, so I, I think we'll have five on C source and then one through kind of this, this Facebook approach as well. Um, but again, you know, businesses should be spending money on marketing, um, to get customers in the door, but a lot of them are, are, are just retrenching right now. And this survey just, you know, for, you know, everybody's record, this was in August, like the beginning of August, the end of August that you did the survey. Um, I believe it was uh, in the middle of August. Okay. Because obviously I think we can all agree the business climate now is getting, you know, worse quickly. Um, and I, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm stressed out about what can we do, you know, and I, and we did the grants, we've done a couple of round of grants. I, I'm, I think I'm in the majority that there's not going to be any CARES funding in the next week. Uh, will there be something in August? I'm sorry, in November or December, probably because the country's falling off a cliff. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I think what we saw with the CARES in, in April is the town moved quickly, got the money out there and then, the PPP came in afterwards. So a lot of our businesses were able to kind of get through the most painful piece of it of waiting for the PPP to come through. And, and I'm wondering if we should start thinking seriously about, you know, how to help bridge these guys through, you know, the, 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 the worst of it could be November and December. And, you know, how do we do it differently rather than a grant? Do we give everybody in town a $10 gift card that they have to spend at Superior? It's 150,000 bucks. Um, I don't know. And to put differently, I had, I had essentially the same questions, but the way I was framing it is obviously grants are a tool. Are there other tools that we should be utilizing instead to be, to help these businesses and, and to help them get through this, um, a different, a different lens we should be looking through or, or anything else we should apply otherwise. And I, I don't want us and not that anyone suggested, I don't want this to tie back to the amount of CARES funding the town got. I want us to think seriously about what else can we do, you know, to, to maintain these businesses in our town, regardless of where the funds come from. Cause I think, I don't know if I speak for the majority of the minority, you know, relative to, you know, the, the two thirds of the municipalities that didn't come out or aren't doing well because of COVID we're doing pretty well. 
and I'd like to you know, utilize the, the revenue surplus. And Paulie probably stressed that I said surplus because it's not, but um, how can we use that and leverage that to, to assist our smaller businesses that haven't done as well due to the COVID shutdowns? Uh, Neil, I like your idea of that $10 gift card. <laughs> I do. I mean, it's, it's, I, I'm, I'm sure there's someone who's like stressed out about how do you administer that? And I, I don't even know. I, yeah, I don't, I don't know either, but. I see on Paul's face right now. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, and I, I don't need to make these comments because you all know about this, but a, a couple comments. Yes, um, we are. We are very fortunate compared to most municipalities and other um, entities in, in the state where we are getting more money than we thought. But you know, to some degree, we included that in the budget. So the budget, 21 budget soaked up, you know, probably not all of that, but but a lot of it. So it's it's not like we're talking, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, you know, again, managing expectations. And uh, yeah, and I know just get, getting money out there to, to help folks, you know, I get a little worried about then the money not rolling back in the town, like with a gift card or something like that. But again, that's probably the least of our worries here. Well, we would constrain it, right? You have to spend it in these businesses, right? It, I think, and I don't even think that would be difficult, you know, given if it's going to superior residence, you got to spend it superior. Yeah. Rather than a Visa gift card, it's a special gift card. I don't, I don't even know how to administer it, but I think you know, I saw it, something. I think Glenwood created Glenwood Bucks or something like <laughs> that. It literally works. It's a, a, a unique. I, I don't know if it's a piece of paper. I don't know if it's a card, but yeah, it, it works at only Glenwood businesses. Uh, businesses yeah, yeah and so they're they and they're using it as a way to also incentivize tourism and that sort of thing. So if you come in and you stay in a hotel, you get 20 Glenwood bucks uh, or something like that. Um, but yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and then they would just bring it into the town and, and get a dollar for dollar, right? Yeah, that's that's my understanding. I haven't looked into the, the program too carefully. I saw it more from the consumer side when we were trying to figure out <laughs> how to get away from the kids for a little while. <laughs> <clears throat> And Ken, this was Glenwood Springs you're talking about? Yeah. Okay, maybe we'll just take a quick look at that program too. Yeah, I saw that it was available to hotels, but not available uh, to Airbnbs. So it had to be actual someone who was paying lodging tax and that sort of thing. Right. Um, the the other thing that that I was thinking that doesn't necessarily come with a price tag to the town other than manpower and advertising. Um, Adam, do you have any experience with like small business Saturday type events or anything like that where we can try to just gin up as much demand, whether it's uh, realistic or artificial demand and try to try to drive as much business to our, our local uh, our local businesses like in a set weekend or anything like that, maybe a set week and anything along those lines? You know, one of the communities I'm working in in New Mexico, they do what's called a cash mob, which they, they, they take around, they do a Facebook live stream and they'll go around to local businesses. And it's almost like an auction. They've got things that are for sale or services that are for sale and people bid on them on Facebook live. And they've done it twice. And each time they've raised, I mean, this is a small community too. They've raised about $10,000. Um, there's another community just down the street from them not down the street, but in the same county, and they raised seventy thousand dollars doing a cash mob on Facebook Live, um, and you know that's going to be primarily for like boutique retailers and and things like that. But that would be something to consider, and and you know typically that's something that like a chamber of commerce would lead down on and would do something like that. Um, and but yeah, I I, I have I have. I have heard of a community doing something like that. They, they called it a cash mob. That's, if you'd be willing to share uh, those details with TJ, that'd be, that'd be great. It's kind of on my list to, to circle back with TJ and talk to him about what, what their initiatives are over the next three months also. Uh, so if he has that background, I think that'd be, that'd be helpful. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll uh, connect with him. I know that they've been doing takeout Tuesdays since COVID started. 
try and yeah. encourage people to eat at superior restaurants. Um, yeah. Beyond what we've already talked about, I, I do appreciate you pulling together the uh, the results from, I mean, it's just a small survey and, and the comments are just obviously anecdotal to these, to these unique businesses that answered, but it's nice to get a pulse, even if that pulse is incredibly depressing <laughs> of, of what to expect and what's coming. <clears throat> are there other things? Are there, um, I understand that it, does the town run its own water utility? We do. Would there be utility breaks that could be provided or deferrals or, or discount? I mean, it's not going to be much, but. Um, you know, I, I think everything's on the table. Um, you know, just anecdotally, what we have seen is, you know, we we're not shutting off any customers, obviously. We are imposing no late fees for any customers. Um, and even with that, I, you know, I look at the aging receivables um, at, the ever, at the end of each billing cycle, and it really is not, not increasing. We've got literally a, a handful or probably two handfuls of residential customers that you know, are not paying their bill for whatever reason. It may be COVID related, it may not be COVID related because some of these individuals are notorious for being, being late payers. So um, yes, we do have a utility system, you know, that, that potentially could be an option, but you know, I, I'm not seeing that at least as it relates to receivables um, rising as, as an issue here in town yet. Well, my thought is if, if there was some relief provided to businesses on the utilities, it would free up some cash for them to spend on, on other expenses. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just almost a different way of, of getting some grant funds to them instead of giving them a check, right? We just give them a credit on their utility bill type of thing. Yeah. That mechanism is there if, if that's something we want to we want to entertain. Yes. That might be something. I was only going to say, I think it, it's definitely look, worth looking at, but I think the challenge is we have really low water bills. I don't know that any of the water bills for our community compared to some of the other ones, like in Parker or Douglas County, move the needle. Um, I like the idea of what else can we throw out there on the table. Because the big big utility bills are for the for the big boys and girls, yeah. for the national change chains, yeah. and you know, and Neil hit the nail on the head. The smaller businesses, their utility bill is relatively innocuous. Um, out of a question for you, though, I mean, and it, this comes back to, you know, getting the message out that our businesses are open. You know, I think we, we live in a time where every newspaper is gone and everyone relies on Facebook. Well, I think a lot of people are getting turned off on Facebook, you know, right or wrong. It's just they're burned out on it. How, how do we how do we advocate for these businesses? Like, what are the other tools that we can utilize? You know, we don't have a town newspaper. Um, <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with how to connect with our 13,000 residents right now to remind them of our businesses. You know, they obviously know about Safeway and Whole Foods. I don't know that they remember that Misaki is right over around the corner next to PetSmart, or you know that Wayne's is open, you know, a couple of days a week. You know, how do we, how do we get that message to them? Well, it could be uh, an iteration of the. Um of the Glenwood Bucks, you know, maybe it's specific to businesses. Maybe it's the, the restaurant, you know, you, you, you do something that's specific to every single business uh, in town that might be struggling. You, you put out those bucks, but they're only redeemable at those businesses. Um, in, in terms of marketing, getting the word out, from what I've, what, from what I've seen in, in the research that we've done, user generated content is the most influential form of media right now. Uh, you know, and that's people posting on Facebook or Instagram an experience that they've had at some establishment or, or an experience somewhere. Uh, and that drives more engagement than really anything else. Um, thinking outside the box, you know, if there was a group of volunteers uh, that could go out and generate that user content, post it on Instagram, post it on Facebook or, or whatever platform it is, going into these businesses and doing user-generated content, that would be one way to get the word out. 
It could be the board. <laughs> could be the board. Yeah, it could be the board. Could be school kids. Could be. I was say this sound actually sounds like a pretty decent initiative for yeah youth leadership council. Yeah, I mean, no one's as savvy as them <laughs> on these uh, platforms. <clears throat> Yeah, and and it can, kind of gets into the world of influencers too. You know, you've got some um, some users who just have a large following, and you know, you may have some of those in the community. You may have someone in the community that's 10, 11,000 followers, and you know, they go to uh, they go to Wayne's Barbecue and and post something on their Instagram account, and you get ten people show up. You know, over the next week or something. Um, so I'm just thinking outside the box. Um, no, and I, I think this, I, I love this, the brainstorming, because, you know, we, we've, I don't think any of us would have been sitting here in July thinking, you know, we're going to be having the same conversation three months from now over the exact same issues. Um, and what we've tried has worked to a point until, you know, we've saturated a lot of people's ability to, to absorb any more content on Facebook or anything else. So everything else that's new, I think is, is a great way to go. Um, I think leveraging SYLC is a fantastic idea to just, you know, bring, you know, reinvigorate the awareness of our businesses. You know, or the board, you know, at least two or three of the board members, maybe just two, um, go and live stream a visit to a restaurant, you know, things like that, you know, a bunch of Instagram posts going pick up at uh, the noodle house. And I mean, none of this takes cash, right? This is stuff that we, we need to do anyways. Um, and it's something I've seen that Louisville is starting to do more of, you know, try to get more postings about visiting restaurants, more, more reviews of the restaurants and the businesses onto Yelp and other, otherwise just to remind people that they're still open. Okay, great. We got. Sounds like we had some ideas and some follow up on that. Um, so, at a minimum, you know, Jeff and I will look at the Glenn Bucks program and get that to Matt. And it sounds like you guys need to. Well, you know, the other thing, the other thing too, I would, I would say about the Glenwood, the Glenwood program, and like the let's call it Superior Bucks, is I think you're going to find that it leverages additional dollars because if if you provide 10 bucks to a family of four to go and visit a, a local business in Superior, that may be the tipping point of them ordering a meal for the family, in which case they're spending, you know, 30, 40 bucks. Well, I was actually thinking every resident would get 10. So I get 40 bucks for my family of four, but no, you're, you're absolutely right. No, Adam, that's exactly what I was thinking of. Cause I've never walked out of a restaurant spending, you know, just this much. It's always, we got a drink, we got a dessert and something else. And that is exactly what, I think we need to think of, you know, cause a grant is just, it's a finite amount in this right. way. Right. It's, it's just what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And this way, and, and I know for a fact, there's a lot of people in Superior that haven't been to all our restaurants. This could be a way to introduce them to you know, introduce them to Wayne's or introduce them to the Asian noodle house um, places that they had never considered going. Great. Or, you know, and, and, and I keep talking about restaurants. I mean, there's some service-based businesses here as well. There's two chiropractic offices, you know, they, they, they've been running um, new client things uh, for 20 bucks. You can get a, a new client visit at hundred percent chiropractic down next to Whole Foods for 20 bucks. Like, and if the town's covering half of that, you know, maybe there's like another 20 people that, you know, is, are exposed to that business. Um, Massage Envy thing, you know, the haircut salon next to Superior, next to Safeway. Every one of those could benefit from this in a way that we probably hadn't even considered. And, and uh, most of these, a lot of these businesses never got any grants um, because they were chain restaurants or, uh, you know, some of the other restrictions that we had. Um, but now let's just open it up. And Paul, when you guys go and look, it's uh, Glenwood Gold. They played on the, uh, the gold theme uh, being there in the mountains. So yes, Glenwood Gold. Yeah. Awesome. We can call our superior coal. Oh, I, I was just thinking the same thing. It doesn't have quite the same ring to it, but. <laughs> okay. Are we ready to move on to um, residential versus commercial development? Kind of the fiscal impacts of both. Yeah. 
So maybe I'll start this off and, you know, Adam, I think you can provide some great insight, but um, generally when I look at fiscal impacts of development, regardless of the type of development, be it residential or be it commercial, and it's primarily because of the high value of residential that we have here, high value of homes during property tax revenues with limited demands on services, you know, they're generally fiscally positive, you know, just as a, a, a general comment. I think that was the comment I put in the last, uh, last comp plan. It was even more so, it was materially more so, you know, Neil and Ken, and I think I've gone through this before, but just to take about two minutes, um, we were materially subsidizing, Adam, our utility operations um, up to, what was it, Jeff, maybe, you know, four or five years ago when we did the debt refunding, but we were shipping a million and a half bucks a year over to the utility operations um, from, from the general fund. And that was just what we were saddled with when we, um, when we um, took control of the utilities. So it, it was even more beneficial to have those one-time um, water and sewer connection fees to, to help us get off that subsidy. And we're, we're now off that subsidy. So that million and a half dollars that was moving over to those utilities is now staying in the general fund and we're able to buy and refurbish community uh, centers and things, things of that nature. But you know, at the end of the day, uh, both are financially beneficial, perhaps commercial, whatever, however that commercial looks, you know, more so if it's office, you know, the, we get a four times benefit in property tax revenues for the you know, same level of assessed value. Um, those even have less demand on service unless it's retail. It's about the only one where the cops are showing up and, you know, dealing with issues, dealing with, the, you know, shoplifting and checks and th things of that nature. But again, ben beneficial. Um, you know, and if I were to quantify, then, you know, certainly if, if, if we could get all commercial in here, whatever it looks like, if it looks like office or if it looks like retail, that's not cannibalizing existing retail, you know, that, that, that's a win-win. But those are some general, I think 20,000, you know, foot views of what we have going on. Well, could I ask a question real quick? Um, mm -hmm. So when, when you did that, or when you look at residential versus commercial, uh, you know, I know a lot of cities now are seeing an influx in sales tax from um, online e-commerce that's being remitted to them through, uh, you know, retailers and going through the tax system, but ultimately getting to the municipalities. Do we know what that looks like compared to sales tax that's generated at point of sale? You know, we're, we're getting a better sense of that. Um, you know, I think our total, Jeff, what's our total sales tax revenue? Is it in the realm of maybe what, 11 million bucks or so now? It's right at 11 million, yes. Yeah, and we'll probably spike a little bit this year. Um, I would say we're getting close to um, probably three quarters of a million, if not a million dollars um, from online, and it's it's increasing every month. You know, predominantly with the uh, with the Wayfair Supreme Court ruling, and then the uh, you know the Senate bill, um, which was effective last year, that required remittance by online retailers to us. So every every month since then. I mean, a couple of years ago, it was a couple hundred thousand dollars. Last year, it was probably close to three quarters of a million dollars. This year, it'll be over a million dollars of that, you know, 11 or 12 million. So that's kind of order of magnitude. Okay, thank you. I was just curious. Yeah. You know, and obviously that dynamic um, you know, before, if you got a, re, you know, a retail business in town that was generating sales tax revenue, that, that was gold. And yeah, it could be a Costco, it could be something other than Costco. But that, because of the internet sales, that dynamic is not as pronounced where, you know, the, the inline retailer um, is so valuable, but, but it is still valuable, obviously. And, and I think what, what's really kind of fascinating about this is, is you think about that office user and Paul alluded to on the property tax basis, it's a 4X multiplier because of, you know, rules we have at the state level. And that's just property tax. For me, you know, the office user is also probably going out to lunch once a week, right? That's revenue, that's sales tax that we aren't getting otherwise. So it's, 
you know, there's the ancillary benefits above just property tax that I think make office sort of, you know, that, that thing you strive for. And if, if the best case was just residential, the incentive that goes all the way up to what property tax is, you know, anything in that, that Delta is a net benefit. You know, so I personally have no problem with, you know, giving half of it to them because the other half is still more than we're getting anyways. You know, and some of the other, and you all know this, but some of the other subjective benefits, for example, of commercial. So, uh, you know, you talk about, yes, office folks go out, they'll help restaurants at lunchtime. But you know, at least they used to. When they come back, then they will. But yeah, you're right. Then they will. But, you know, there's always been the dynamic, obviously, of, you know, rooftops help, help drive, you know, other, other businesses that we're looking at in town. And I, you know, and I'm assuming that's, that's still a relevant factor, Adam. Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. I think you guys are so uniquely positioned because you've got those destination retailers. You're certainly punching above your weight in terms of your population compared to the retail dollars that you get. You guys know that. But that dynamic also presents a risk factor as well with the future of big box and how things are shifting to more e-commerce. And, and I know that, you know, I look at my household spending and our shift towards online. Um, and that's only going to accelerate, you know, e-commerce has seen double digit growth for years and, and that's just going to continue. I, to, you know, your point, yeah, we call that the indirect effect, um, from an economics perspective, right? It's that multiplier effect where one job may actually create two other jobs in the community because they're going out and they're visiting restaurants or they're going to a service place or, or what have you. So those direct, what we call direct jobs are the economic engine within communities. Um, and restaurants need that daytime population from the office to be successful. So, you know, if you were to incentivize something very heavily, um, it should be office. Yep. And that's where, you know, I think this summer, uh, the, the board uh, weighed in on the Zaharis property. It's about 22 acres. It was all residential. Uh, but we have zoned it as commercial. And the point that I keep, you know, banging the drum on is at no point have we ever thrown in an incentive for the builder to truly do commercial. Because with, an, with residential, it doesn't matter who you are, you will sell a house in Boulder County. It is probably the easiest real estate job to have because as long as it's got four walls and a roof that doesn't leak, it will sell. So rightfully the developer, they wanted to build, uh, was it 100, 189 homes? So, but at no point, you know, and we said no, because it was in our commercial, it was in our, our uh, comprehensive plan as commercial, but at no point did we truly say, Hey, you know, here's the revenue that the town would get, you know, on the residential basis, we have that, but we didn't calculate, here's what it could be worth to us on a commercial basis. And what if we split the difference or some ratio with the developer to make them less at risk on the commercial development? And that's, I think, the point that a few of us on the board made. You know, let's let's look at parcels like that in Resolute. We know what the math is on a residential development. We know what it means to the town for the next 10 years. We know how many homes we can cram in on that space. But, you know, given that footprint, 22 acres, how much commercial space is that? And what does that potentially mean? And then what does that work to us? Yeah, and you know, it's easy enough to do the math. You know, I was looking at, you know, a million dollars in commercial valuation will give us, you know, about 2,300 buck, bucks a year. Um, we'll get some initial, you know, building use tax. We don't have business to business tax here um, when they go in and they buy their computer systems and their office furniture. We don't tax that here in town. So that's, that's I would argue, a tremendous benefit. But, you know, that's, that's additional money that, you know, we're not going to be able to give back type of thing. So it's, it's easy enough to do that calculation. I'm just wondering if it's enough to move the needle, but, you know, it's something. And I think that's the challenge. You know, when I look at projects where there's a public-private partnership and where uh, a town or a city are contributing in dollars, it's most impactful as if it's uh, some form of, um, incentive that reduces the capital stack. Price, the price. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. So if you can reduce the equity requirement from the developer or the amount of debt that they have to service, 
uh, it makes their project uh, function economically much better than it otherwise would in receiving an incentive over time. Uh, unfortunately, most of that money comes through TIF and to do that in these areas that I think we're talking about just hasn't been feasible. And you know, I've talked with Clint and Matt about the likelihood of getting participation from the school board in the county and they didn't see that any, any type of participation uh, would be likely. And so the question then becomes, how do we split that difference between the residential and the commercial and how do we get that in the hands of the developer so that it can be reflected in the capital stack? And Which is why you're seeing sort of these hybrid developments that are not all commercial. It's a, it's a commercial and residential development to split the, to sort of de-risk it a little bit more. Yeah. So to, to ask the questions along the same line, but a little bit differently, what is our optimal number of, of rooftops here in Superior to support the businesses we want? I mean, obviously that's an impossible question, but I, and especially not knowing how A, COVID is gonna change things long-term and B, just how retail is gonna to continue to change. But I mean, in, in my mind, and Zaharis has done, it's over, but I, we have 1400 residential units that are uh, gonna be coming online uh, in downtown Superior within four or five years, whatever, whatever that time frame is. That's, that is a significant increase in, in residents. And that with that is a significant number of people who can support those businesses uh, in town that in theory have struggled and, and we're gonna, this will help provide them a lifeline. So where, where I've struggled in uh, taking A, the, the near term easy, uh, easy money with developers wanting residential versus pushing back and wanting to uh, wait for that additional commercial down the line is, are we gonna have enough uh, residents and, and rooftops in town to support those uh, businesses in the future? Or is that just a pipe dream I have and there's no sense in continuing to push back? And in reality, it makes more sense to to, to accept that residential is what makes sense. Well, you know, the, the feedback that we've gotten from a lot of end users that we've reached out to try and recruit into Superior has been just that. Um, they have concern that the market size just isn't there to support their business, considering the other businesses that are already in, in the town or in proximity. It's not a function of any decision that the town of Superior can make because you're landlocked and you have all the open space between you and Boulder that is undevelopable. Um, and that's just the reality of, uh, of the situation. So it, it it really, I don't think you'll ever have the house tops um, that you need in order to build out all of your commercial in, in a way that the local population can support it. And that's why destination becomes so critical um, to, to really attract in those destination users so that you're not just dependent on your local population. And that's, just, that's been our strategy from day one. Uh, you know, we recognize that the, the purchasing power with, we call it purchasing power. And, and it's just what you've described, Ken. You've got so many house tops, right? Times the average wage, that's the total income that they have. You have to take out housing costs and then other necessities to get down to a disposable income amount um, from those house tops. And then you just look at spending, you know, in consumer preferences, you know, if the household spends 1% of their income on food and beverage, like what is the purchasing power within the market radius for food and beverage consumption. And it's just very formulaic. And you run those numbers on, you know, 14, 15,000 people. Uh, and it certainly does limit the amount of disposable income that's available to support local businesses. But you know, it's, it's about how do we get people from Boulder? How do we get people from Lewisville in to spend their money? Um, that would be destination. And from a moving the needle perspective for you going out and recruiting people, I mean, 15,000 right now, if we had 20,000 in Superior or 23,000, that's that's not necessarily enough to even to move that needle uh, from a uh, attracting the businesses that you're you're out there trying to find without also having to pull in those regional uh, visitors. 
No, because I mean, the, the users that we've been focusing in on have been the ones that are, are not going to be dependent so much on the local population. And so what they're looking at, they're looking at larger, larger market radiuses uh, outside of Superior. Does it move the needle having you know, 23,000 households as compared to 14? Absolutely it does. It moves the needle a whole lot. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it really is formulaic. And you know, the more housetops you have, the more purchase power there, in the there is in the community. Paul, do we have a rough estimate of, of what we project Superior's population to be once downtown Superior is built out and once Superior Shores is built out? Uh, I guess anything that has been approved, do we have a rough idea of what that's going to put our population at? You know, it may be upwards of 18,000, um, you know, looking at the, you know, roughly 1,000 in downtown, those other developments you identified. I forget what multipliers we used. I've seen anywhere from 2.5 to 2.9 per single family. That'll drop, obviously, for, di for different types of set uses. But, you know, 18,000 is, is, I think, the, the highest number I've seen. Okay. So Neil, I know you're the one who kind of brought this one up. I'm not sure that we really, I'm not, I'm not sure we've answered, you know. No, I mean, I think, I think we have, or, I mean, it, this kind of, in my mind, kind of, it, it's linked to item one on the agenda. You know, as we think about incentives, I think we can collectively agree that, uh, you know, residential, um, residential is the baseline and, you know, uh, commercial or office generates more tax revenue for the town and it's a balancing act from an incentive perspective to you know, get more of, of uh, I want to call it variables Y and Z if X is residential. You know, so as long as we align the incentives to point towards Y and Z, and that you know they're they're revenue neutral to if we just turn it all over to residential, then I think then we're consistent with the strategy. Because I mean, the the board could just decide to take you know, and, and using town 15 and just turn it over residential. We know we can predict that tax. We'll know what it is, but I don't think any of us want to do that. I think we'd like to see more of a commercial footprint and, and we have inhibitors, right? I mean, the, the amount of open space and we've added to that in the last you know six months um, that makes it more difficult, but I, I don't want to just throw up my hands and say, we can't get any more commercial because we can get the residential and we know what the tax revenue is going to be for that. And if we're only a residential community, then fine. But what I want to try to do is, is maximize the incentives all the way up to that level that, you know, the commercial footprint is revenue neutral to residential. And that was my thought, my thinking around item three, I think Sandy had asked that same question when we were talking about Zaharias is, you know, we had a comp plan that had, a lot of specificity about commercial space in a lot of the parcels and we both the current board and previous boards have approved changes to the land use to allow residential you know to where i think we had 10 parcels now we have two or three that are av available for commercial and the rest have gone predominantly to residential so there's a there's a trade-off that we've made and now with what we have left how do we try to how do we try to make that commercial happen so Adam, it's like whatever you can throw in there. My thinking here was, um, we can we can, we can sell residential anywhere. We don't want to. We want to sell commercial and office to where it sort of makes us a better town, just you know, in terms of things to do, and then it just you know better buttresses and diversifies our revenue stream. So not, not, there's nothing, there weren't any numbers to talk about here I, I, other than just, you know, a, a sort of esoteric discussion on, on, you know, the different tax revenue streams that come from land use applications. Yeah, and, and just to add to the philosophical discussion, of, <laughs> I, I mean, what's gonna come down to is, yeah, we could forego residential today that would bring us a, a known quantity and, and hope that we're gonna get that commercial down the road. and it might sit there for 15, 20 years and, and who knows if it even does come about. And 
uh, there's a discussion of, okay, what's our opportunity cost of letting it sit there uh, and, and not be generating tax revenues, uh, residential tax revenues on an annual basis or those initial tap fees and, and whatnot. So, I mean, if, 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 if we're purely looking at dollars and cents, I mean, there's, there's probably a decent argument that residential now is still better than commercial 10, 15, 20 years from now. But there's the, the piece that talks to the character of the town and what are we, what are we trying to, to be once we're built out? So. No, actually, Ken, you're right. I mean, in the sense that if we just want to be the town where everybody drives to the neighbors, you know, we, we drive to Broomfield, we drive to Arvada, we drive to Louisville, then that's, you know, that's a strategy. Um, I don't think we want that. So it's how do we, how do we bring those businesses here? And how do we make those businesses want to come here? And then how do we help them thrive? Right. But Adam, you brought up a really good point. I mean, if somebody's going to do a, you know, some sort of a commercial development, we got to find a way to, to manage the capital risk, which. And, and to your, to your point and what I've seen developers do with, with their land use applications and, you know, talking this through with municipalities and, and a lot of planning boards and town boards struggle to understand this, but if you know lease rates are here and construction costs are here and you can't achieve the lease rates to warrant new construction um, it's not going to happen in your community but if a developer comes to you and says this is how i can make the construction and the economics work is by doing residential on half of this and deleveraging my investment that would allow me to move forward with commercial um, you know if it's part of a package deal where the, the town is saying, okay, but you have to come out of ground, you have to come out of the ground at the same time with the residential and with the commercial, not, we're not gonna, we're not gonna allow you to do a bait and switch, right? To do the residential and then come back to us later and say, I can't make the commercial work. <laughs> I, I don't wanna say that we've heard that argument already, but I think we've heard that argument already. We've heard so. that argument. I'm working on a project on the on the, the other side of the table with a developer, and um, and that's been a strategy for them as well was to you know, sell off residential parcels to delever the commercials so they can they can make that happen. Um, yeah. So I, I mean I think you know thinking creatively, land is another one uh, that I had suggested. You know, it just depends on the the commercial use that's being contemplated. All right, well, good talk. Um, next agenda item is re reserve policies. Adam, you can certainly stay and, you know, if you have any in input, we'd love to hear it, but or, if, if you need to leave, you can certainly leave, but uh, I'm gonna talk about some specific items here with reserve policies and performance measures. That's certainly outside my realm of expertise. I don't think I can <laughs> the conversation. So uh, I'll, I'll bid you adieu. Thank you, everyone. Great, thank, thank you, Adam. Adam. Thanks, thank Trina. So Neil, Neil had sent out, uh, you know, his, you know, brief summary on reserve policies. And I'm sorry, Neil, we generally have that information as well. But you know, I think what Jeff and I see, and your, your data confirmed it, is the larger the city, the city and town, Denver, Sea Springs, things of those natures, very relatively small reserve percentages, but their 10% is, you know, tens and tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. And as the municipalities get smaller, the reserves percentages go, go up. Um, and, uh, you know, if we're looking comparatively with what Neil pulled out there with neighboring municipalities are around 20, 30% reserves we're at 75% reserves, you know, we're, we're a little bit out of line. We are a little bit smaller than them. And then we have a much different dynamic than them as it relates to um, where the revenues are coming from. And we are so uh, dependent on so few retailers. And that was really the impetus back in 2003. And then with a, a review of the reserve policies, what a decade or so ago, um, that was still a, a major concern as it relates to 
revenues, the majority of sales tax revenues coming from, you know, a handful, truly, you know, five, five businesses in town. So that I think was the, at least the initial impetus for keeping that reserve higher. But we're always struggling with, we don't want stranded investments. We don't want stranded capital. We want to try to invest that in the community, you know, be it spending it or lowering rates and fees and taxes. So that's, that's the ongoing dilemma. No, and so I, that, Paul, Paul um, sorry to interrupt. I, I think this is really instructive because, you know, we, we already talked about um, our incentive policy, which was set up in 2008 and then the reserve policy set up in 2010. I think the dynamics of the town have shifted. I mean, a lot of this was predicated on big box retail, which, you know, if you go back 10, 15 years ago, that's all we were. I don't know that we were substantially different yet. And I think that's the challenge. Well, and, and Ken, I think, brought this up in the annual report review. You know, one of the most telling documents that's unaudited is exactly what Ken pointed to in the stats section, where it looks at over the last decade, you know, how much revenue is generated from, is it, Jeff, is it 10 retailers that comes from that stats section, do you know, off the top of your head? I'm looking at it right now. It's 10, it, yeah. It's, it's the top 10. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that was at 80, whatever, what is it, Ken? Was it 86 or something or 88? And yeah, in, in 2018, we were at 86. and 2019, we were down at 81.8. Yeah, and, and that's great. Um, but I can tell you when you see that document this coming up here, it's not going to be 81. It's going to be 83, 84. We're, we're, jumping, we're jumping back up. And even though we've gotten, gotten down to 81%, I mean, I, I'm used to, in larger municipalities, and um, Jeff and I came from Thornton before, we were worried about top 10 retailers generating more than 30% of the revenue. And that had an you know, impact on when we would go to rating agencies and, and, issue, and issue debt. So we are you know, arguably a long way away from being, in my mind, you know, diversified from that, from that revenue perspective. Yeah. Um, are, and I know you can only speak uh, to this so much. Um, I mean, looking at those top 10 from this past year, Amazon is the only web-based company um, that's in that top 10. Uh, are, or A, they continuing to take a greater and greater share of, of that pie from the top 10? And then B, do we have any other web-based retailers that are, are anywhere near the top 10 and, and you don't have to give any names just a, a yes or a no if, just to help understand how how much the web impact is helping us right now so i'll first answer your questions um amazon is is moving up in the list they're top 10 and they're moving up in the top 10 um are there any others who are materially impacting on the individual basis, uh, the, the, the top 10 or, you know, the, um, or, or revenues in, in general, no, but collectively they, they are having an impact. I mean, when, so I gave you the stats before, a couple of years ago, a couple hundred thousand dollars by online retailers. Now it's gonna be over a million bucks th this year. Um, and that's just drips and drabs for a large degree. I mean, we back in the day with no online retailers, we had three, 400 people remitting sales taxes to us on a monthly basis. What's the latest report, Jeff? We were over 8,000, maybe up to 10,000 remit, you know, people remitting. Many of those are zero filers, but many of them right. are two bucks and five bucks and seven bucks and, you know, $30 and a hundred dollars. It's just the collective impact of those is having a very positive impact because it's not materially negatively impacting our brick and mortar stores. And just anecdotally, when I'm looking at this report now to give you kind of a heads up, there's about another three online retailers that would break our top 20 if we actually move them up, which we probably will next year. But that's kind of the order of magnitude as you're looking at three other retailers. Uh, that have, you know, some impact, but that's still, you know, less than 1% of our total sales tax. Gotcha. That, that helps tremendously. Appreciate that context. 
So, yeah. so that was obviously one of the primary drivers for those reserve policies. And, and, and then to a large degree, that, that amount of cash that just effectively sits there and at least right now earns very little in interest income. Can you speak a little bit to when these were created in, back in 2003 and then reviewed again in 2010? What, what was the, I suppose, just philosophical goal of them? Is it, did, did we create these amounts because that's what was going to take us to, to, to get through another year? Or did we create these amounts because we ran some type of scenario analysis and that was if we lost a major retailer, this would help us uh, lessen the blow for a certain amount of time? Or what, how did we come to these specific uh, numbers. So the initial policy, which was established um, in 2003, that was right before I got here. So I, I don't have a lot of the, the background information, but you know what I've heard anecdotally. So I've seen no modeling that said we lose retailer number three. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how long do we think, and we'll need to adapt to that. We will have to modify spending. Um, we assume that by losing retailer three, that there's going to be some assumption that it, does most of that revenue leave the town? Does it get absorbed by, by other retailers who, who remain here? Um, you know, there, there's a lot of moving parts associated with it, but the thought was that that retailer, that box is going to be out of, out of business for a year or two years, and it's going to take us, you know, that long to try to fill it. And by trying to fill it, it's one thing to get somebody to fill the space. Um, and there was always the question of, does it fill the space at the same, at the same level? And right. I think it was, you know, probably not. So then, you know, this reserve helps you while that store is vacant. And then it helps you adjust to maybe a, a new normal, a new revenue stream as well. But were there hard quantifiable numbers? I, I've never seen those. So Paul, out of curiosity, um... You know, prior to the Goldfish and uh, the furniture store coming into what used to be Sports Stable, I, I can't remember what was in there before Sports Stable. Sports um, Authority. Sports Authority. <laughs> was that in the top ten? The the predecessor to the Goldfish. Yeah, I mean the Sports Authority, which I mean it was on the downward trend before it finally closed. I don't. But... I don't think it was, Jeff. Okay. You know. I'm not in the model, but yeah, I mean, here's my question. I mean, it, it, as you think about sports authority and then how long it took to backfill and the business is very different. I mean, at least we have a comparison for losing a big box and then what it took for the market to sort of rebound. Is it an apples to apples? Heck no. You know, goldfish is very different in terms of what it can generate for uh, tax to the town. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, when you think about what Ken asked, you know, how do we model this going forward? If we lost one of our current big boxes, what have we seen in terms of historic time for, you know, backfilling? Yeah, and when, you know, Garts and Sports Authority, when they left, it was, I don't know if you have it up, Jeff, but it was yeah. half a dozen years, wasn't it? What's that? It was a half dozen years before. When it was a while. Close. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure out <clears throat> back through, I'm through 14 <clears throat> and they were, you know, looking back on it, they were between the top 11 and top 15. Uh, and I think it, I want to say it closed in 16. I'm trying to find it, that but yeah, they, right. they were a top 15, you know, top 10 to top 15. But again, keeping it in perspective, that's, you know, uh, maybe a percent or two type of thing. If right. that. And, uh, and so it actually filled sooner than I thought, say in four or five years, but you know, you look at a Buffalo Wild Wings that's been vacant for, you know, longer than that period of time. Um, yeah, and, and the new normal, as we've all talked about is if, uh, you know, and those are midsize. So get a big box that, that actually go, goes dark like a Sam's Club. And that's, you know, in that case, that's never gonna redevelop anything close to that. And it's only been, 12 years, 10, 10 years, maybe, <laughs> you know, for that. Well, and if you look at what Louisville did on its North end where the Safeway used to be um, sort of where, uh, what is that? South Boulder road. Yeah. You know, they just went and redeveloped the entire parcel. So you got alfalfas and you got a whole bunch of residential as well. Yeah. Is, but that came at a cost as you well know, did. they, 
basically a million dollars not to recover any of that sales tax revenue for three years. Right. And I may be yeah, the other thing. The other thing I'll add is, you know, Ross ended up being split into two stores, but to give you an idea of where it was, it was actually in the top 10. Uh, and now the two that, you know, the one now that's still left uh, aren't even in the top 20. So, you know, when you do lose that, you it does take a while. And, and from what we've seen from the two that we've kind of lost, they've never even come back to being 50% of the revenue they, they used to bring in. But I should let you know that, you know, we lose those stores. We factor those into the budgets. We didn't have hard conversations with your predecessors on, oh my gosh, we lost Ross. We're going to have to do some material cutting. You know, they really don't move the needle because they're not in the top five, combined with the fact that if it's in the marketplace, um, any new dollar that's generated, about half goes to Bricksmore as part of the incentive. Any loss of a dollar, they, they get... 50 cents less. So it was moderated both ups and downs because of the incentive with Bricksmore, which will you know be gone after probably 2021. So what's just, the to, just to add to that, looking at percentages, our top nine are the only ones that bring in more than 1% of our sales tax revenue. <laughs> it's a very funny looking Pareto chart. <laughs> Wow. So, so I guess the question, I mean, I, so I, I don't have any experience in setting a reserve policy. Um, so, I mean, what, what is the, the, the right way to, to set a policy then? I mean, I, obviously we, we could assume a worst case scenario where we lose a, a top five um, and, and what should we have put away for that? Or maybe it's a scenario like what, what was it? South, uh, South Meadows mall, uh, where they had the the hailstorm, or Park Meadows Mall, uh, where they had the hailstorm, and there were everything in the in the mall was down for a year. I mean, that would impact uh, probably all of our top five. Uh, I mean, what what's the what is the benchmark we should be shooting for? I and, and that's a question I've been kicking around in my head, and I don't I don't know the answer for that. You know, Jeff and I have been doing this for decades, and I'm not sure we have an answer for you <laughs> for you either. But you know, I think. You know, right now we got some really, really good retailers. Mm -hmm. um, at some point in time, that will change. And, you know, it's is it going to be two years or, or 20 years. You know, I think I'm almost more worried about the natural disaster that, that, that occurs and, you know, that taking out your revenue for, you know, for hopefully a finite period of time and then it comes back at the same level. You know, we can, we can model any of those, but I, mm -hmm. I just because of the concentration of uh, retailers in town where the top five generate the vast majority of the revenue. To me, generally, that would speak to a higher reserve versus a lower reserve. Is it 75%? You know, maybe it isn't 75%, but boy, it's not, it's not 20%. No, Paul, right. I appreciate that. And, and I think that's why I kind of just, you know, browse the web to see where people, you know, where some of the other communities are at. And you look at some of the younger communities, you know, like Lone Tree or Erie, they have a much higher reserve than some of the more established communities like Golden or Louisville or Lafayette. And that makes, if you step back, that makes tremendous sense. They've got, you know, those older communities have much more established businesses. They've got, you know, a revenue model that they can predict. But, you know, I think what, you know, Erie put it pretty, pretty well in their, in their, uh, in their budget, you know, due to the volatility of the town's revenue streams, Special share could be given to decisions committed to specific portion of the town's fund balance. Um, you know, it's that volatility and the uncertainty is why we have the reserve. And you know, obviously, Erie is growing like bonkers. Yeah, so I, I agree. I don't know what the number is either. Um, and I thought there would be you know an easier way to find an answer, but I think this has just given me an insight into what you guys are dealing with and not knowing. So I guess the question is. Do you guys think we should be reevaluating the the reserve policy? Are are we at that right spot now, or should we should we be considering tinkering or adjusting? I think some of the funds, some of the operations, predominantly the utility operations, we could consider looking at that. Typically, when you look at a utility, 
um, those fund balances are typically smaller um, because you have the flexibility to um, be a little bit more agile with those utilities since they are fee-based systems. If, if something happens and you need to raise fees, you can do it relatively quickly without voter approval. Um, why those reserve policies that Jeff pulled up in water and sewer and storm or at that same 75 man 100 max level is that was back in the day when we were transferring a material amount of sales and use tax to support those operations. Um, and now that we're not doing that, I think we could reevaluate those. And, you know, maybe, maybe some of the others, but, you know, some of those, oper you know, kind of core operating counts like landscape fee and open space, you know, those, those are probably in the, in the right level. You know, the general fund, especially with the new revenue source coming from online retailers in general, you know, that might be a little bit high, but again, and, and we could look at it and give, give you some options, but um, you're not going to get a recommendation for me to get it down to 25%. <laughs> no, and, and Paul, I think, you know, I don't know about Ken, but I mean, I, I wasn't looking to go from 70 to 20. I was looking for, or from 75 is, you know, does it make sense to go from 75 to 65? You know, that level of detail, because I, I think I'm in the same boat as you guys now, given the concentration that we have. Um, none of us want to be, you know, crazy with the reserve. But, you know, if we could release a few hundred thousand here or there and deploy it within the town, that might be beneficial given, like you said, you know, the, the growth of online retail, I think pr provides that shock absorber, you know, to our big boxes that we didn't have before. Right. Um, and, maybe also, I, I think right now it's so black and white on paper that there's, there's that fear, especially if you haven't actually dug into it, uh, if I get anywhere near that, that below that balance, we're, we're doing something we shouldn't be doing. Maybe instead of uh, just a, a clear, this is what our reserve policy is, maybe we say we have a reserve target and then also a policy below it. So maybe our, our target is uh, the, the 75% uh, and maybe our policy is nothing below 65 or something like that. And then that I think would also give better guidance to the board when we have kind of those those uh, abnormalities like what happened this year with uh, promenade coming on at the last minute and <laughs> we're dipping below our reserve policy this year. But what does that mean to me? What, what, should, what should I be taking from that? Are, am I truly, are we making a terrible decision because we're, we're going below our reserve policy or are we safe doing so? And in that, and I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but in that particular case, if we told you we're dropping our reserve policy, you know, next year it's going to be about 60%, and it's going to remain at that lower level for an extended period of time, you should be concerned. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be as concerned as, as we're projecting to get that back up to the level in the um, next year. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and we've got this other little dynamic going on as well, um, something called COVID-19. We... You know, we don't know how that's going to impact us. And, and we are, you know, far from the end of that. Now, if, if things are true to form, we will continue to outperform financially compared to our, our competitors. But there, there may be a great recession component, you know, once this is over and even after we get the, get the vaccine. So that's, you know, another in, intangible that we've got to, you know, know that's out there as well. I, I think right now, given given that risk, I, I I don't know that I'm in any hurry to change our, our reserve policies for the general fund. Um, I think maybe if we get past uh, COVID-19 and get a vaccine sometime this year, then then maybe that's a conversation for tinkering next year. Um, I I agree the the water sewer storm that that makes sense we those are more predictable we've we're not subsidizing those as much anymore so or at all anymore so yeah i i think that makes sense i i i'm more of the 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 mindset and this is the auditor background in me of just being incredibly conservative so <laughs> i i'd be more more apt to keep it at 75 and 100 rather than than dipping um if we don't have a, a really solid reason to uh being in the midst of a pandemic yeah, I think that's our recommendation. 
And I think, I, and I don't disagree. I think the only thing I'd like us to consider as we look at the 2022 budget, you know, you guys kick that off in May. And if, if, you know, the, the worst of COVID is actually behind us, um, can we, as part of that budget, look at, you know, tinkering with these, these reserve percentages? Um, only because, you know, at that point, Bill have been on the books for, I think, 15 years, 18 years. I can't do my math anymore. It's late. So, you know, at that point, you know, given, cause I mean, I think we'll have another six months of data with, re with respect to, you know, how the big boxes have done and then how uh, online has continued to thrive. And, and macro events and whether we're seeing yeah. recession nationwide. And yeah. yeah, no, I think, I think I have no objection to that. And I think this will help, you know, Jeff and Paul, I think this will help the board also, you know, if, if we want to pull a project forward or push it out, you know, does that does that track with a you know relaxation or stiffening of the reserve? Yeah, I think the the incorporating it in the budget discussion is just a general good policy to have. And but I think the timing, as you articulated, Neil, hopefully should should work out pretty well. Where we'll have a little bit better handle on what the heck's going on. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, Otherwise, I'm moving. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, that's what we plan to do on reserve. We'll evaluate and we'll include in the 22 budget discussion then it sounds like. It is three minutes before eight. Yeah, so I think the only thing left was the KPIs and you know, I'll go first here. This, what you guys sent, you know, the, the one pager on finance is exactly what I was hoping for. Um, and, and the reason is twofold. One is it, it forces us, you know, the board to kind of think critically about town, town operations, you know, and I think depending on the metrics you choose, you know, we should probably start to see where we're headcount deficient or we're headcount rich, you know, because one of the things that jumped out at me just, you know, on, on, on its surface is the number of customers that are using paperless billing is quite a bit lower than I expected. You know, so what is it costing us to mail statements to everybody annually? And you know, if we gave everybody a five dollar credit to, to go to like an eighty or ninety percent, do we save money? It's like these little things that you know. I think my brain works to you know find you know where can we be more efficient? And if we're looking at some of these KPIs, there might be some opportunities for improved efficiencies. But I don't want, I don't want, you know. You know, three staff members dedicated to spending every day tracking a bunch of stuff that doesn't mean anything. It's a question of what, what is important and what is it that we as a board can help you guys with, with your job so that we're looking in the right direction. Yeah. And again, I don't have the answer to that. Um, you know, larger organizations, uh, you know, and Denver is not a good example, but I'll use Denver as an example. I, knew back in the day, their director of the performance indicators, and she had a staff of, I can't remember it was, six, eight, or 10 type of thing. You know, you, you know, everyone can go to Louisville's budget, and that's where these typical th things typically reside. Their budget documents are almost balance sheet documents where they'll get updated once a year, and then you can, and then you either look at them or not, and, and maybe make some some strategic decisions uh, around them, but uh, you know, Louisville has a staff, and even on top of that, they're paying a contractor. I don't remember what it was forty, fifty thousand bucks to, you know, manage this this for them. So, it's always a you you do want to drive benefit. You want to you know identify output and performance and efficiency measures to show folks what you're doing, and if it's great, good. If it's not so great, then you make modifications. But it's it's a fine line. So I, I'm babbling now. Yeah, no, I, and Paul, I mean, part of it is, is, you know, we, we hear that the pools are old and they need to rent, they need to be renovated, mm -hmm. but how many people use a pool, pool each year? How, how has that number changed? Is it going down? Yeah. Is it going up? Yeah. Um, you know, like if you think about each department, you know, parks and rec probably has 10 things that they measure already. Let's just put that into one place so that the staff or rather the board can see that. And that, well, and, and you know what we do have is is in the budget book. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know that that's there. What what I can do is you know we can we can you know cut and paste and surmise you know and get a summary of all our performance managers in one location. So at least you see what we're looking at, and you may say great, or you may say far from great, or, or somewhere in between. But at least it gives you a sense of what we do have. 
And I think it might be an iterative process so that we, right. we kind of hone in on, on what we think makes sense. Well, let, let's at least start there. Let's at least summarize this in one location so at least you can see it and then that, that'll be a starting point. How about that? Sounds great. And, and I, I might be really deficient here because I don't think I've looked at the formal budget document after we've approved the budget. I think I've been looking at all the pieces as we go through the budget review and approval process and I don't look at the final product because once it's approved, um, yeah, so maybe I, I'll, I'll go do that, you know, uh, right now and then um, sort of, you know, I think maybe if it's just an extract for the, you know, the half dozen pages that you already have, that might meet, the, that might meet what we need. Yeah. Um, and again, to manage expectations, uh, you will not be looking at a 2021 budget document. You'll look at the 20 budget document. So we, we're a bit away from a 2021 budget document. But look with the print out yet? Come on, Paul. <laughs> Jeff, that, come on, Jeff, get going. On <laughs> um, so look at the sections like the general fund and the and, and the water fund, for example, the, the narratives on the on the individual cost centers, finance, admin, water supply. That's where you'll see these performance measures, but it should be easy okay. enough for us to just pull them out and summarize them in general. Yeah, I think that that'll be a huge start. Okay. Um, generally then for next meeting, general time frame, you guys want to kind of keep it on a three month schedule and look for kind of end January type of thing. I think that makes sense. That would give hopefully an opportunity to get a third person onto the committee um, and hopefully have, get their feet at least a little bit wet. Uh, well, unless it's somebody's already on the board, but yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, let's, let's do that. Um, and then well, you know, that, as, that assumes that Ken and I stay on, right? <laughs> are you, are you planning on resigning in the, oh, nope. from the finance committee? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So we'll generally plan on that. You'll have the dialogue with committee assignments, I think, if not in November and, and December at a board yeah. level. So that'll probably work out okay. And then after that for third person gets identified, then we'll start some emails and work on agendas, things, things of that nature, unless you have any topical items you want to ensure that's on the next meeting. Um, I do. So I, based off the, the discussions at the end of the, the, the budget meeting, the last budget meeting. Um, it sounds like there's finally some interest uh, from at the full board level to uh, start discussing uh, whether or not it makes sense to start charging our full mills that are authorized. Um, I Going into that conversation, I, it would be helpful to, and Paul, I've already asked you these questions, uh, but it, it might be helpful to have a broader discussion with more people of what are the various revenue sources we can be tapping that way we're not being myopic on or that way I'm not being at least myopic on on just those four mills and then obviously there's the other side of the equation the the expense side um, I don't know if there's I mean we can go line by line and see where if we want to reduce things on that side to make sure we can pay for other things uh, but if there's any discussion you think that it would be worthwhile uh, from the expense side, um, then that would be good. But just providing kind of a, a, a general overview and good baseline for, for when we have that full board uh, discussion. And I think if we have a, a discussion here at the finance committee first, you're likely to get a lot, of, a lot more questions from us and we can make sure we have all the questions that hopefully will come up at the full board meeting answered before then, that way we can have a, a more productive conversation when it gets there. Yeah, and I like the thought process. You know, too many times, all our colleagues in other municipalities, they, they just look at enhancing revenues and, and the, there's another side to that equation and that's the expense side. So I, I think yeah. it's incumbent upon us to look at, at the whole picture. So I, I like that approach, Ken. Perfect, that's the only thing I've got on my list. So as we get closer, you know, and we've talked about this once in the finance committee, I'll probably reach out to you, Ken, and just, you know, just try to get additional clarification, maybe bounce some ideas off you just to make sure we're utilizing everyone's time in the most efficient manner. Okay, that works for me. Neil, anything that's jumping to, to you right now as it relates to agenda items? You know, you have three months to think about it. <laughs> 
I'll probably get it to you the week before the meeting. No, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll think about it as well. Okay. Um, but I, I think just, is this our third meeting? I think this is, I think these are going great. I appreciate all the work that you know, Paul and, and Jeff are putting into these things. Cause, and, you know, I think obviously, you know, with the November and uh, October meeting schedules, you know, like I think Ken and I would love to get a crack at the quarterlies before they go to the board. Cause then we can pepper you guys with all the questions. Yeah. Um, obviously with the schedule, you had to get it out, which is fine. Um, but I think in January, if we can review it, we'll probably spend at least 15 to 20 minutes with the questions on that alone. Okay. And I'll talk to Matt about that. Um, you know, Matt wants to try to get it out to the board as, as soon as yep. possible. And, uh, you know, even if we, for example, did the finance committee, not the last week in, in January, but maybe the third week yeah. before the board saw the financials that fourth week, boy, that's, especially that time of year, that is, that is cutting it really, really tight. Um, so, you know, maybe it's an issue that you see it the fourth week and then the board sees it the first meeting in February. I, I don't know what the manager's thought is on that. Yeah, and I, mean, I think if it's in the agenda for the finance committee, all the board members see that. So it's not necessarily yep. something that they don't see. And then it's just formally adopted or, you know, um, approved in the following meeting. But that way, Ken and I and whoever person number three is, can yeah. pepper you guys with all the questions and not, you know, take away from the board. Okay. Well, we'll look into, you know, making that uh, agenda item and, you know, uh, yes. So we'll look into that as well. And I think there's also other value in it. I mean, either Neil or I will, or whoever else joins, uh, always give a, a briefing to the board during the report section of the meetings on what we talked about. If we, if we touch anything that's significant on the, on the third quarter or on whatever, quarterly financial report we're looking at, I think that just helps the, the board hone in on that and, and gets adds that much more value. So I think bringing it to the finance committee first will help the, the greater board as well, if that yeah. helps deviate any, any thought process that Matt has. Oh, and I think that document, especially for a new member, that's, you know, that's where you're going to get your feet wet and you're going to, you're going to learn whether you want to or not, you're going to learn really quick, um, you know, what the finances are all about. So I, I think that's a good review document, yeah. Oh, and, and one one thing is, you know, in, in I think it was last, no, I guess Monday, um, we, we improved or increased uh, Matt and then all the uh, town manager um, uh, delegation levels. You know, so one aspect of continuing to keep the same level of transparency out there, I don't know if it's just in a, it's in a, uh, an addendum to the financial quarterly report on what was approved. I think that'll help with the board to truly understand how the delegation has, has improved efficiency, you know, where we can see things that would have traditionally come to the board. Now, you know, they were administratively handled by staff and by Matt. Um, okay. you know, oh. It's probably gonna be like three lines anyway. So it's not gonna be a lot, but I think it'll help just with the transparency. And then just to, you know, for the, if nothing else, a metric on you know, improving efficiencies for the board. I'll chat with Matt and we'll let him know that that's, that's something you'd like to see. And just a quick question for you guys, just a random thing that jumped out at me that is pretty small, but just interesting. I saw that we had a 56% decrease in court fines during the third quarter. Is that because nobody was out driving, so there weren't speed, speeding tickets? <laughs> Well, it, that combined with uh, the enforcement activities of Boko Sheriff were, you know, somewhat diminished. You know, they they didn't want to make these unnecessary stops. I mean, if someone was wild and crazy out there, they'd stop them. But, you know, for something that wasn't, you know, life or limb threatening, you know, they just didn't want to expose either party to, you know, un undue, undue germs. Yeah, I, kind of what I assumed. That makes sense. But there it is worth the, worth the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we had some, you know, so there was revenue lost. It wasn't the same amount, but we had lower expenses because we have, I think, what, 50 or 60,000, Jeff, in directed patrols where, you know, the deputies can take additional hours and write tickets in, or in town or enforce traffic in town. So expenses were down, but they were down less than revenues were down. Gotcha. Okay. And not that I ever want that to be a, a, uh, <laughs> revenue generating line nope. simply for the sake of revenue generating so no we, we always say with that 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 you know we don't generate revenue we're just enforcing you know we're enforcing traffic 
codes to make our make our community safer, and yep. sometimes that results with uh, results in fines being you know tickets being issued. Yeah, and it, as we hear repeatedly in the in the traffic and safety commission, the most expensive thing you can do for uh, calming traffic is to park a sheriff anywhere. So you know, at yeah. best, this breaks even. Most cases, we lose money with the tickets anyway. So, yeah. Um, but Ken's right. I mean, it looks like a big step down, but the corresponding spending was lower too. So, right. Yeah. All right. Well, great. Thank you, gentlemen, for uh, all three of your time uh, this evening. Yeah, thank Absolutely. you guys. Just, thank as you. always, this was very educational. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.